And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra. It is the Monastery Gazette. It is September 19th, 2020. Let's get it. Let's get into this because now I do. I do have to note a few things. Um, for one, I had planned on having the review of the Magitek Chronicles up today. That is not going to happen because of a rendering problem, which means I get wit, which means I got to go and do, I got to go and do a bu do a bunch of stuff all over again. So I'm going to try and have that up by tomorrow. Sucks, but it is what it is. Um, at the very least, I was able to get all of the get all of the um, RPG a day things pre done. And let me just state that if RPG a day is doing this one word prompt thing again next year, I'm not going to be out, but I'm not going to be doing it on um, video form. I'm probably going to just do it as a series of tweets or a series of Facebook posts. You're not going to be out, but you're not going to be in either. Yeah, this is the the problem. The problem with the um, with a lot of the prompts was that I was struggling. I was struggling for a while to try and talk about that one prompt for five minutes, and a lot. And you'll note it. You'll note as they go on, some of them are a lot shorter than others. A few of them only go about ninety seconds in length, and that's simply because of the fact that um, I. I would not make. I would not do good at filibustering, like I, I could not do the whole thing of just stre of just stretching one topic on for that long. Other people could I, do that. I am not other fair, people. Be fair, you need a group of us to do that. Yeah, and with some, with some of the um, pro with some of the prompts that are that were given, it was way too vague, and I had to send a message to Autocratic saying. Could you maybe could you maybe not do this next year? I realize it's cute. I realize it's cute and all to have it looks like a hex crawl, but could you not? Because <laughs> I think this is like the second or third year that he's done. Yeah, this is the third year that he's done that particular format. Go back to doing questions. Those were easier. <laughs> Um now put now putting that putting that aside I will ha I will have um I will hope I will hopefully the re the review for Savage Kingdom's 3rd edition will be going up on time but if it ends up getting delayed well it is what it is um But with that said let's get started with the Kickstarter spotlight and the first one that we've got is Atma Described as a role-playing card game. A full-fledged RPG in two hours. They're asking for 20,000. They're at 21.5 thousand with eight days to go. Not too, not too bad. And hang, hang on a sec, because Kickstarter forgot that I logged in. Darb! So, barp, barp, barp. Atma, a volcanic material, powers, empowers the living and entwines the dying, while AI and alien titans join humanity in this daunting new century. Yet in the restless zones beyond society and law, trouble lurks. So, Atma is designed to be a role-playing game in a tiny package. Portable, quick to set up and teach, and plays in just two hours. Perfect for late nights or pop-up sessions. Probably not good for conventions, though. I think I think having people sit at a table at, at one table in a convention for two hours might be pushing it. But as far as a, as far as a beer and pretzels game, if you, if your runtime is two hours, that's perfect. And they want it to be a tutorial for first time GMs, and I like. So let's see: two dice, fifteen tokens, rule book. Four characters, so eight cards each. One stage of fifty-one cards. 
And then the Act 1 box has a few has a few more items. The GM runs the show. They select a stage and break it into six decks. Backdrop, stories, scenes, extras, props, and twists. The backdrop shows where they'll be exploring. A random story card tells them their overarching goal. Three more scene card flip throw out three more scene cards, flip the first one over, and you're ready to start. As a play, you'll earn as you play you'll earn tokens when scenes start and when players fail rolls. Spend tokens to play more cards or do things with your existing cards. Interesting. As a player, you'll grab a character deck, just eight cards, and lay out four of them. Your character itself, two moves, and one super. Are we sure this are we sure this isn't powered by the apocalypse? Because that's the vibe I'm getting. You get that feeling too, huh? Um And let's see, narrate what you do. If there's a chance of failure, you roll dice and see what happens. Oh, and apparently they put in a Neomorph page so that people can try so that people can try the game for free. That might have that might have helped them get the amount. Plus, they have um, print and play files. Nice. Let's see. Then the stretch goals. Nice, nice. I'm not sure if they're gonna get to forty thousand up to forty thousand when it comes to it, and the idea of doing seasons is interesting. Although when I look at the, when I look at this, I'm seeing more of a straight up card game than I am an RPG. And because of that, in order to do some research, I might send a message to Neomorph Games to uh, get to see if I can get them on the show. To me, it be... sounds like, something, like this card game seems like something to get you started in RPGs mm -hmm. more than anything else. They did. They did admit that's one of the that's one of their things that they want to do. They want this to be a gateway drug. You think they'll pull it off? Well, they've got well, they got funding, and they've and now maybe 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 one day we can we can test we can test out their uh, demo version if I can get enough people on that. Hmm. Let's see. So next, Diamond Throne is heading to the Cipher system. And holy shit, did they break the goal? They're only asking for 14,000 euros. They are currently at 55.1 euros. 55.1,000. Damn. Or $65,329. Um, now, Diamond Throne was used as the setting in Unearthed Arcana back in the D20 days, and now they're bringing it to the Cypher system, which, smart move in my, in my opinion, because I'd rather run the Cypher system than run, than run 5e in this. Um, and Ar Arcana Unearthed and Arcana Evolved were very, very good series of supplements for, um, D&D 3rd Edition. And now, and now they're bringing it to the cipher system. And for the for the record, the cipher remember the cipher system is what we ran when we were doing Numenera. Oh uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they so one of the things they wanted to go with it is a world that it that changes as your characters do. Um. So this was this was this was a setting that was created by Monty Cook, um, through the Ar Arcana Unearth and Arcana Ev Evolved um, books. And I would say it leans in the realm of epic fantasy, which I'm perfectly fine with. Oh, I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening. And we have our favorite CEO, Xanatrix, in the house. Sorry for the, uh, hey. the lateness. 
just uh, it was a long and dusty day at work. I had to uh, clean off before I did anything else. No worries. Uh, um, we are cur- we are currently on the Diamond Throne. The Diamond Throne. Got it. Oh, I'm still early then. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, we started up and pretty much had fun at sports teams and uh, the, the, the at sports teams. Mm-hmm. All right. Um. So, so book one is the core book one for the Diamond Throne is going to be on the people and the land of the well Diamond Throne. Um. Covering cosmology, gods and religions, and the planes of existence, as well mm-hmm. as material for adventure and campaign building. Um, core book two is on character creation. And since you weren't here when we when I mentioned this, I should I should note that Diamond Throne is used that this version of Diamond Throne is using the cipher system. Okay. Let's see, and let's see, it's going to have foci, background aspects, skills, and equipment. The complete cipher system game rules along with um along with some along with its own additions. And a smart move that they made that they noted, you do not need to own the cipher system rule book to play Diamond Throne. This is completely standalone. So it'll have the cipher system basics inside of it then that seems to be the vibe i'm getting okay uh i think i think that's true for a lot of their source books to be honest um i know that uh numenera has an entire because it technically came before cipher system was a codified thing has its own uh has all the cipher rules in it and i think um gods of the fall didn't yeah, Gods of the Fall was was I think the exception. To be honest, the the rule seems to be I mean, with the strange cipher system and now Diamond Throne, it seems to be that it does always have cipher system basics in it, and it was only Gods of the Fall that did not. Yeah. Um, well, the strange came before they codified it as the cipher system. Yeah, and 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 so did Numenera. I think that's why why uh, Gods of the Fall is an exception rather than the rule. Which is a fair assessment. Let's see. So, also, have... if I if I remember somewhat correctly, wasn't Gods of the Fall uh, sort of a, a partially third party thing? Mm. Like there was a lot of influence from outside parties. Yeah, I guess I I guess I can go with that. Yeah, not not exactly third party because it was still Monty Cook. And, and all of that set uh, set up, but it was mm-hmm. uh, it was there was a lot of outside influence, people who were who were bringing things to the table. Um, now it looks like they've gotten all but three of their uh, stretch goals. The um, next one is going to be on adding adding in companions and familiars, and after that, um, special instant locations, and lastly, a player notebook. Um, it's not going to be a de- it's not going to be a deal breaker if, um, if those last three stretch goals don't get hit. But um, let's see how much time they've got. Actually, last two, um, the sixty two thousand for the um, companions has already been hit. It's at sixty five right. now, so we're almost we're almost to, to the special instant locations upgrade. The only one I don't see them getting is the player notebook. They've got eighteen days, and they've been getting some pretty steady money. I, I don't know. They might. Um, I can't say for sure. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Then it goes into a bit on the cipher system, and um, I should I should note that I've always enjoyed the defining sentence thing that the cipher system uses. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm an mm-hmm. adjective noun who verbs. It's my. It's. It is one of the best. Uh, character creation systems i've ever run into to be honest Mm -hmm. because it it allows a person to first think of who they are rather than what their stats will be and obviously each noun and verb and and adjective um changes their actual stats changes how what skills they have access to etc but that's 
that's not the super important part. The super important part is describe your character in a way you want to describe your character. Yeah. Um, let's see. Then when when it comes to the races, I know they want. I know people want me to call it ancestries, but no, I'm not. I'm only doing that if I'm doing if it's a human only campaign, and this ain't that. Um, we've got humans. We have Dracha, which are kind of human dragon chimeras. We have Fane, who I keep wanting to kick because I don't like fairies. Let's see, we have we have giants, aka my people. Although I might be a midget by comparison. Um, Latorians for the, for you filthy furries. <laughs> 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 um, who are they are cat people? Um, Moj, um, who seem to be freaks. Sibekai, who the, the, would... Mo, the, Mo, the Moj look to be um, humans turned turned into dragons mm -hmm. or something like that. That's... So my kind of people. Yeah. <laughs> And then we have the whole thing with the with the heroes. Um and the and the importance of magic in the sense that this is not a low magic setting. Magic is everywhere. Is it but, just me or does that does that seem to be the case with most of Monty Cook's stuff? He likes a lot of magical and mysticism in his worlds. I um I have to I've never I've never had the chance to really meet Monty Monty Cook and really have a really have a sit down with him on that matter and from what I hear he's he's kind of antisocial. Um but I have I have to wonder if he if he grew up playing RuneQuest at all at all because now Rune RuneQuest was made by some by somebody who what was a practicing shaman and and had a background in that in um in the in theology and i th i think when it i think when it comes i think when it comes to it it's more of it's more of the fact that he probably when when you look at the way magic was treated in really early white box era D D, &D um <laughs> It was paradoxically extremely powerful and yet supposed to be extremely scarce. Um, and I, I could see the possibility that Monty Cook's uh, magic is pre magic is everywhere. Um, policy is a bit of a response to that. Well, I can see that. Uh, I mean. But let's also be honest here. In early white box D and D, while magic was extremely powerful but supposed to be extremely scarce, player characters, man, player characters. <laughs> Somehow you could get magic pretty easily as a player character, even back in the white box days. Mm -hmm. Not as easily in later editions, but this, this is this is why I keep telling people who have some sort of romanticized version of. Um, of the of those early editions to pound sand. <laughs> now for the next one, you knew I had to put this on. <laughs> oh man! Common America is coming back with volume two. <sighs> Common America, Jesus! Oh my God! I have not heard of this. I met... Volume one was really good. Yes. <laughs> Volume and one it... was really good, and um, and it pissed off all the people it was supposed to. It pissed off oh, all really? the right people, and <laughs> it ba it basically gave us it basically gave us the um, for all for all intents and purposes, it it is the kind of vibe that we would want from a from a Miss Mar from a Miss Marvel that Marvel isn't going to give us. Or a Wonder Woman that DC isn't going to give us. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> big boobs and not afraid to show off the big boobs. Uh, if you go to the Kickstarter page, you'll see exactly what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I am on the Kickstarter page. <laughs> then you know that your assessment is 100% correct. Yeah. Although I will say this, those thick thighs do seem to save lives. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, they got they got fucking Genzo Man to do the cover for Volume One. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I know. Um, oh. But yeah, we we deal with um, fa- fashion designer turned superhero, um, Charlotte Car- Carly Vanders. Um, <laughs> I was just I was just kidding about the Miss Marvel thing, but that but that isn't helping. That was intentional, and you know it. Yes. A C. Vanders versus a C. Danvers. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm glad that they're kickstarting Volume Two. It's a uh, well past its goal. <laughs> yeah. And. It se- it seems that this time the wo- the woman who was fo- who was a pre who was a previous enemy in common comment or Misha Lovakova is n- is now going to be sw- is now going to be doing a face turn. Although my favorite scene involving her was that was that whole thing of angry Russian noises and then angrier Russian noises. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. And just also, look, also, I can't, I can't help but, st- but state how much I enjoy, how much I enjoy the art when it comes, when it comes to it. Like yeah. this, this is what happens when you have people who have, who have fun drawing and would probably just draw anyways. Have fun drawing and would just draw anyways. Sure, but uh, then they realize that people actually like their drawings. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh wow! They're also going to be doing a reprint of Volume One. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Calling it Stars and Strife, which is. <laughs> you know, I was going to say that's on the nose, but it's not. But given the fact that this, keep in mind that th- that Timothy Lim's other project is Black Hops. Yep. I get that joke, Maddie. For the Maddie, for the record, Black Ops is about Black Ops bunnies. Uh, uh. <laughs> uh. I choose not to get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh. I just. I like this. I this is this is fantastic. I'm I'm excited to see more stuff from Tony Lennon. They were only ask. It's this kick. This Kickstarter only um, launched a few days ago. They were only asking for two thousand. They are at thirty seven point six thousand. Yeah, yeah. People, People like see. it. Yep. And oh, shit. I had this. I had this one in. I had this one earmarked, but um, looks looks like looks like Shep canceled. Now, Chris Shepperson, aka Shep, is somebody who I've had on previously to talk about his work, the Gaia Complex, and I had actually signal boosted um, this Kickstarter on Twitter, but it looks like he's canceled. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, I see that. That um. I wonder what's the update on that. Let's look at the update for yesterday. Let's see. It says postpone funding until 2021. Mm-hmm. Decision doesn't come lightly. Let's see. He feels take... like it wasn't up to standards is what it looks like. So I, I get the feeling this isn't a case of him throwing in the towel, but more of we fucked up. We're going to we need to redo it. And there's also a few potential partners that have approached them, um, and timing the campaign mid-month was potentially a bad call. After talking to a number of super backers and Kickstarter creators, it's a time where people have less disposable income. Mm-hmm. Um, this this seems to me like this seems to me like a case of of had the timing been right, we would have we would have kept going, but. Timing yeah. just 
fight to fuck us over. Well, and they also feel that there's some improvement to be had on their actual project itself. So, yeah, this this looks like a case of uh, great plan. Uh, Kickstarter was poorly executed, and so they're deciding to go, okay, we're going to end the Kickstarter for now, come back later when we've had a chance to regroup. All right, I'm, I'm probably going to shoot Shep a, D, a DM just, say, just saying, hey, when... when um, when you relaunch the Kickstarter, just shoot, just shoot me a line, just shoot me a line, so I can, um, so I can, I can try and promote it and maybe get you back on the show. Yeah, no, because this, I think the other thing is he's worried about um, saturation. There's a point here about there are other cyber th- cyberpunk themed games uh, on crowdfunding platforms, and they all look really gr- uh, great. Uh, when they chose and announced the date for launch, the games were not making noise, and they weren't aware that they would be running at the same uh, that they would be running at the same time as the Gaia complex. And then it's now clear that that um, essentially, since they all overlap, they're trying to quote share backers, and uh, some people just can't afford that. Yeah, fair enough. Now for our so, last, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, that's actually a, a very... I give super kudos to Shep for that. Um, he's like, I wanted to fund this here, but there's a bunch of other games that are coming out that look super good too, and now we're all splitting funding and possibly messing all of us up, so I'm going to pull out so they can have it. That's that's super cool of him. I can't stress smart that enough. Bu- smart business too. Mm-hmm. I don't even think it was as business based for that particular facet as we might think. I think he was literally like, "Oh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a name, but these people may not be a name." So, the last Kickstarter we have is Titan Home, a steampunk RPG. Well, that's a uh, interesting. Yep. Um, so it's designed to you. They say it's using the fifth edition open source license, which um, I'm not. In, but the way that they worded it makes me think that it's not exactly going to be going to be um, a five a necessarily a five e compatible in the in the typical sense. Otherwise, they would have worded it like that. They have an entire section on game class or uh, game mechanic adjustments. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Although the way the setting is described a bit, I get a I get less of a of a steampunk vibe and more of a um, post apocalypse vibe. It's definitely got post apocalypse to it because of the shattering. Yep. But then that reminds me of a very famous series of books that were post apocalypse that no one knew until the author wrote uh, wrote their prequels, um, the the Shannara series. Yeah, fair. Which is definitely <laughs> fair. Um, then we go into the regions, the grasslands, the four towers, the crystal crystal lake. Um, beware of anybody in a hockey mask in any place near called Crystal Lake. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful. If I ever played this game, I would design a character that wears a hockey mask and came from Crystal Lake and wields a giant choppy weapon just for the hell of it. Did you did you ever hear about the um, about the about the Jason Lake incident in Minnesota? You mean the fact that there's an actual statue of Jason at the bottom of Crystal Lake? Yes. Nice. That's that's not a good idea. That's never a good idea. (laughs) I have no idea what you're talking about. That's brilliant. No, no, no! You, you, it's very, it's, it's an excellent prank. That's what it is. Yeah. Until because until... ima- imagine scuba divers who are just hyper anxious and know what the fuck Jason is, and they start swimming in the, under that lake and they see Jason just pop up. Boom! Ah, fuck! 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 Until someone takes it in their head to put mechanics into that statue and make it move underwater. Stop oh. giving me ideas. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't say anything, Mike. You're the one who's, who's ma- saying that's an idea. I don't know. That, can you underwater weld underwater electronics? I don't no, think but so. I could probably find somebody to do it. <laughs> I, I I'm not saying Zadari Industries knows a guy or even has a fleet, but I might know a guy or have a fleet. 
And but uh, anyway, um, I do like I do like the design of of uh, this guy for the um, pirate sky port. I really like, like the, the art. Yeah, it's like this weird it's like this weird mix of cir of circuitry and gilly. Yeah, that um, was that was an interesting look. So, so when it comes to game mechanic adjustments, let's see, they've eliminated alignment. Thank you. Um, <laughs> they're destroying all former lore for player races since Titan Home societal structure collapsed. There is less emphasis on race, which has been renamed lineage. Um, you know, I, I, I really hate wizards for that. I really hate wizards for that. I say hate the people who were who were bitching up a storm about that who don't even play. But I can I, I let, hate I, I can I safely hate say that any any game that is any um game that is ever produced with the with the open license under um under Knack Jack Studios will not be following suit with this. Yeah. It, it doesn't changing race to lineage while still technically correct doesn't make sense calling each race what they are a race because they're literally separate species isn't now, they are some sort in, of they argue in this case since there are no racial tropes such as subterranean dwarves or forest dwelling elven, elven enclaves Lineages can develop any number of strengths and weaknesses based on the new environment and background story. Ooh. Okay, that goes a little bit of a ways to justify the change here. Hmm. Well, and looking at some of the later stuff, I've just been skimming up and down the page. Um, the shattering seems to have uh, have shattered the entire realm almost into elemental fractions as well. The, like the elemental realms have a portal you can just go to. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this almost reminds me of Weiss and Hickman's chaos gate cycle as a, as an inspiration for this. Uh, I just, this is great. I love the art. I like looking at, at some of these uh, new steampunkish things. Mm hmm. Except it still seems more cyberpunk than steampunk in some cases. Yeah, let's see. We are doing new arc. We are doing new archetypes. The school of technomancy for wizards, the college of technology for bards, a sniper for rangers, um, and demolition for barbarian. A demolition barbarian likes to see things go boom. They dabble in grenades and specialize in setting charges. So every barbarian, except this one, slightly smarter. Um, it reminds <laughs> it reminds me of the meme about the barbarian who took alchemist as a feat, who had that uh, alchem barbarians barbarians who have the alchemy feats are are as rare as you think they are for the reasons that you think they are. Yeah, like, I'm just I'm just imagining someone raging while chucking grenades. <laughs> oh wait, that's demo man. So are you saying he only has one eye and drinks while talking? Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's see. A new player class called the Remnant, which is a construct relic from old world technology. They look like any person from Titan Home on the inside, but in, underneath they're machines. Interesting that they make this a class instead of... In, I'm kind of reminded of that debate during fourth edition about whether whether um i think it was either assassin or actually yeah yeah it was um there was an idea in there was an idea late in fourth edition of of vampire being made into a class instead of a race um i i remember that very vaguely that argument i didn't play a lot during fourth i was committed to other things at the time and I had been kind of moving away from D D at that point. Um because three point five I got exhausted on and it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh vampire being changed to a class 
instead of a race, you'd have to nerf all of the vampire skills. All, all of the spell-like abilities and everything, you'd have to nerf them heavily. Um, because the entire reason they were a race was so you could give whoever took vampire as a race a huge level adjustment. Because a, a level 3 vampire can create an army of ghouls and overrun small villages pretty easily. It's it's one of those things where I'm kind where I'm kind of iffy about it. Um, let's see, they're apparently going to have a adventure called the Magic of Chaos that's running from level one through twenty. Nice, very nice. Wow, an adventure that runs straight up to the max level. So chapter one is Opalhurst, levels one through four. Chapter two is Fortune's Coast, levels five through eight. Um, chapter three... Crystal Lake is 9 through 12. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Chapter 4 is Winter Fortress. Oh, hey, it's my house. <laughs> and, it, and it goes all the way to 20 in mm -hmm. Winter Fortress. But um, Crystal Lake has a lot of golems. Y you could make a uh, Jason golem as, <laughs> as an antagonist there if you really wanted to. And we have Elemental Realms and the Shadow Realm. If I end up running Shadow this Realm. and and we end up going into the Shadow Realm, if I hear even one Yu-Gi-Oh joke, I'm beating the shit out of you. <laughs> <laughs> you you do realize that no matter who you play this with, unless they're com they've lived completely under a rock, one of your players is making the joke. Oh, I know. It's just a matter of who's it's just a matter of who's getting their ass kicked. Or who dares want wanting a a a, a size? Uh, and what what shoe do you wear? Fifteen. Same here. A size fifteen up their ass. You see, it's almost tempting for me to do it because Monk and I are basically the same size, and it would be a good scrap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. You remember, you remember how Borderlands had that D and D parody, Bunkers and Badasses. Yep. Well, mm. that's getting made into a game, and um. Oh Jesus. I. Appa they're claiming that it's been edited by Tiny Tina. And and they which therefore makes it a bajillion t times better. Um, probably not. <sighs> The a source... bajillion T times yep. better. Um. <sighs> it was good when the memes in Borderlands were just memes. From what... I, I will consider this to be dodging a bullet partially, because when I first heard about this... I was nervous as hell that I was thinking, oh god, they're going to try and convert um, Borderlands into D&D &D 5e, aren't they? Aww. Fortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case. Apparently they're using their own set of rules. That, um... I don't know how well that's going to turn out. And... At the very least, with that, I'd ha if I do cover Bunkers and Badasses, I'll have more to talk about. Although I do have to say this. Um, Vincent Baker beat you to it. Okay, okay. So, a question I have. Nerdvana Games. Is, is it an independent studio, or is it a branch of Gearbox? From what I understand, this is an independent studio that was given Gearbox's blessing. Okay, then I'm a little more, I'm less full of disappointed, disappointed and ready to be disappointed, and a little more just wary and expecting disappointment, be, again, because it's Gearbox. I have no hope for Gearbox these days. Randy Pitchford can, well, he can go pitch himself on his own Ford. Um... When it comes to that, all I have to say is get to the back of the line. Back of the line. I've been at the front of the line since Borderlands 1. Don't you dare. I've been <laughs> here for a long time. 
Don't I dare. You don't know me that you don't know me as well as you think you do. I know. He <laughs> just basically went, Shh, I'm about <laughs> to fire you. <laughs> See, then there's the whole thing with Time and Throne. We already talked about that. Next, um, you remember when I you remember when I covered that unimpressions on dark dealings in the shaded souk? Well, yes. it looks like that particular scenario is getting a print version by Modifus. Nice. And it's going to be in a hardback version, which is even nicer. Um, yeah. As part of the Black Void collection, and anybody who buys the heart, anybody who buys the physical version gets the PDF version for free. I always love people who do that. Any any group that goes, hey, you get our physical version, you get also get a digital version free. I'm two hundred and ten percent behind that. I, I got Ten Rabancho Zeros physical editions, and you know the PDFs came free. Um, the day I purchased, rather than, than the day I got the books. So I was able to use the source books until I got the physical books. Um, Cubicle 7 ha has had that as a policy for years, that they'll do that. No wonder I love Cubicle 7 so much. That was, that was the reason I, I didn't mind um, reviewing um, being so positive about Soulbound. Because I had said, I'd said the sole reason I'm giving that the time of day is because they're handling it. Yep. And to be fair, I was exaggerating partially when it came to the uh, Sigmar issue. It's just that Age of Sigmar had a rough start, but now it's at, at least respectable. So for the mm. next... Now, all I have for this is just this countdown clock. And yes, I don't like countdown clocks still, but... There was a story last week that I glossed over, and in hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have. Mm. Hasbro has divested Avalon Hill from from under the Wizards of the Coast umbrella and made it its own I and made it its own um, line. Ooh! And there's been rumblings for the past few months that Hero Quest might be making a comeback, given given certain trade given certain trademarks that were registered over the last six months, and. The fact that we have this particular countdown, which we'll probably do a follow-up next week once this countdown is over, I get the feeling we might be seeing a new hero quest. Even if it's just a reprint of the original, I'm perfectly, I'm perfectly fine with that, simply because of the fact that the original hero quest um, board game is kind of hard to get. But of course, the best thing about hero quest is more hero quest. Yep. So we'll see how this plays out. Um, next, Warhammer 40k meets Risk. Although I do like the um, subtitle they gave for Risk in this version: "The Grim Dark Game of Strategic Conquest." Ooh. Everybody, everybody's trying to cash in on Grim Dark. Um, in this case, they're going to the source. So, I mean, yeah. smart, smarter than trying to cash in on, on the trend. Well, it's smarter than the, than the average bear, I'll tell you that much. Now, in, unlike... Now, some people might go, why, are you, why, are you, why would you be invested in, 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 in a new edition of Risk? Here's the, here's the thing. Unlike, say, the Monopoly special editions, which only rarely change up the rules. In fact, we've covered all the one, all the recent ones that did, for better and for worse. Better being um, troll games like Monopoly, like Communism Monopoly and Monopoly Millennial Edition, and for worse, in cases like Miss Monopoly or um, Monopoly Extended Edition, because somebody decided somebody looked at the complaints about the game being too long and said, hold my beer. But when it comes to editions of Risk, like, Risk 2180 does not play the same way as Vanilla Risk. The same goes for the MGS4, um, M M the Metal Gear Solid Rifts, which introduced Outer Heaven as a, mo as a moving country. 
Which... Yeah, that was... Um, I've played Metal Gear Solid Risk once. Outer Heaven can absolutely go suck a dick when you don't have it. So when you a do movie... have it, everybody hates you. Exactly. It is. It is that. It is the bastard piece. Yes. It is the piece where no matter who has it, they are the bastard. Yeah. The bastard piece. <laughs> it makes you think of, of a show called The Bastard Piece Theater or something. Um, is that what Pac would call his YouTube channel if he had one? <laughs> no God, yeah. <laughs> I it would not surprise me. <laughs> I would pay good. I would pay good money for him to for him to do Bastard Beast Theater, <laughs> even oh, if it's God. just like a random ass segment on being the elite. I would pay money for that. I you are not alone in that set in that statement, man. Wait a minute. There's also looking at this this article. There's also a 40k Monopoly coming out. Yeah, which I which I do not give a shit about. This one doesn't change the rules. Look, when it comes to when it comes to ninety nine percent of special editions of Monopoly are just the same game with a different coat of paint, which is why I don't give a shit. Yeah, I'm just, and this one doesn't look to be any different than that. Yeah, just you know, Warhammer forty k tokens for for game board pieces, and instead of calling it the community chest and the chance cards, it's fate and glory. Boring. Yep, boring indeed. I'm a, I'm much more interested in Risk Warhammer 40k. Also, if that's supposed to be Abaddon on the cover, um, I call bullshit because his arms are still attached. <laughs> <laughs> See you at the party, Abaddon, without your arms. It could be before he lost his arms. It could be an earlier Black Crusade, for all you know. So. One of the adventures that was that was announced for um, Wrath and Glory, called Reign of Mercy, is now been made free. It was this was their entry for Free RPG Day, and um, I thought it was going to be there and then gone, but it looks like they put it back up. Um, it is a quick start and introductory adventure, and it's designed to give simple rules and, as the article says, tell the players fix bayonets. And I'm perf I'm perfectly fine with that because well, if you're in the 40k universe, you're screwed anyway. So you may as you may as well you may as well die to the enemy instead of dying by the commissar. Commissars are the real cowards. They don't even sit on the front lines. So next, Kings of War has decided to go naval with Armada. And with a giant headline misspelling on this. Uh... On this article. I feel bad for whoever wrote this. Well, it wasn't me. <laughs> it was Polar Bear. I, yeah, I know. I'm just saying, maybe he was watching something and it subconsciously affected him. Yep. Mm. But Kings of War, which has been a pretty, which has been a pretty successful um, minute um, um, war game over the years. Is now going into the naval front with Ar with Armada. It'll be hitting store. They did open pre-orders for this recently. It'll be hitting store shelves this November. Um, I think this is going to end up leaning more towards a board game than. Oh, they are calling it a war game. Never mind. It's just that they're going to be doing a two-player starter set. I might add this to the short list of th of um, play a pirate themed game when I when I do that for international talk like a pirate day. Simply mm -hmm. because um, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the whole talk like a pirate day, people tend to phone it in a bit too much or go with the easy stuff. And unfor unfortunately, the thing that I'd like to do for something like that, I can't because there's no way I can afford it. Because I had the dumb idea once of um ha of 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 finding someone to play a hurdy gurdy for it. <laughs> If I have a hurdy-gurdy by that time, maybe. 
Oh, do you even know how to play that? I will learn. <laughs> no, you, you you don't understand. It is my absolute favorite instrument. And if I had to, want, was forced to learn only one uh, instrument to perfection and could never learn another, it would be the hurdy-gurdy. Oh, yeah. I love the thing. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's just that I think I think the, I think you're gonna get more out of the idea of playing a pirate themed game than ju than just doing a bunch of R's, or barring that, just listen to Alestorm. In fact, do that anyways. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, put the black sails opening on repeat or whatever. It's got a good hurdy gurdy line to it. Mm -hmm. I'm not lying. <laughs> um, or anything from The Witcher. They used Hurdy Gurdy all over The Witcher's OST, and Sonia Belasova has been um, has been explaining her songs on YouTube on the Player Piano channel that she was a part of years ago. Mm -hmm. So next, oh hey, Games Workshop remembered that they have a Middle Earth game. Ah, the pretentious, obnoxious bastards of London finally remembered they have a Middle Earth game. Games Workshop has that has had this um, redheaded stepchild attitude with their Lord of the Rings strategy battle game for years. Um, where it, se it seems it seems like they'll they'll give it some attention, then they'll neglect it for several years, and then they'll give it some more attention, and then they'll neglect it for several years, and it's just up and down like that. But. It looks like they're putting they're trying to put out actual supplements and new minis for it with the supplement for called Quest of the Wing of the Ring Bearer. Um I think I think it's basically it's basically going to be a ca a campaign book and um to be quite the the Middle Earth SBG is interesting. Especially, especially given the fact that if somebody plays Smog, that's the only thing that they can play. Um, but the thing is, is that it's meant more for six hundred point games than the one thousand or two thousand point games you would see in Warhammer. Yeah. Or God forbid the uh, apocalypse style games. Oh, don't! <laughs> I uh, I have I have read through the apocalypse rules. I have never played Apocalypse Rules myself, and um, I have. How much coffee did you have? Coffee. I don't drink coffee. I drink soda. That's I sugar and that. caffeine. And it was a seven and a half hour game, Nids versus Necrons, and it was my friend's Necro Necrons army because I'm not stupid enough to buy Games Workshop stuff. How many points? I think we went six thousand. In the end, he gave up because my Necrons kept getting up because I have insane dice luck when it comes to their revive rules. <laughs> That's how it is with the Tyranid. That's why I'd, I'd love... One death battle that I'd love to see, even though it's not going to happen, is Zerg versus Tyranid. Nids win. <laughs> there's, there's no contest there. Uh, Zerg might be terrifying, horrible things that corrupt the land they're on. The Nids are a literal bio-organic machine. They, they, they're a process. They're not a race. They go to place, get on place, eat every little scrap of material on place, leave place, and, and continue. Mm-hmm. Now next is a is a um is going to be a setting book for pa for Pathfinder called Lost Omens Moanki. And the reason why I wanted to highlight this is when to when the 5e Tomb of Annihilation book came out that was clearly taking some African influences. There was a sizable amount of butt hurt from people doing the whole cultural appropriation thing, and I want to see if that ends up following suit with this.
given that they're doing es essentially a not Africa and um well I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna run it um would you like to guess what I would what I would do to anybody at my table if I ran this and they and they shouted Wakanda forever you'd kick our ass no, I think he'd probably find a way to get that character killed in the weirdest and most ironic ways possible. So kicking your ass, then. Pokédo Stos. There you go. <laughs> Either that, or I tie, or I tie you, or I tie you up and hang and hang you upside down from the tree. Hang them by their thumbs. Mm, nah, too much work. Okay, I can see that. And next we have um, the fact that so Fantasy Flight Games are, are the people who currently run the board game version of Civilization. Which is weird because Civilization started out as a board game. But with the whole, with with everybody with everybody still scared still scared of the beer bug um they have they have been looking into the possibility of doing solo rules. For me, that seems kind of pointless because if you want to do a solo version of Civilization, just play the video. Yeah, I was gonna say buy the games. Um, well, if you if you've already if you've already got the board game, odds are you've got at least one you've got at least one of the video anyways. I'm bored. I can't play my board game with anybody. I might as well go on my PC and watch Gandhi nuke me. <laughs> A bug that became a feature. I love that bug that became a feature. Stack underflow is a real problem. Yep. Um, so next we have a, a work no, known as Magatsu Varheit Zwerst. Or Zwerst. I'm really bad with German. And it looks like it looks like this is being directed this is being directed by the by the person behind Future Diary and The Devil is a Part-Timer. Wait a minute, they, they mixed German and Japanese? Magatsu Wachheit Zust? Yeah, that's... That's not confusing at all. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not like there isn't a precedent for, mi for mixing, those two, mixing those two in... Um, in or just just doing hodgepodge of cultural mixing in Japan. Period. Oh, well, that's true. So this is a, an adaptation of a magical apocalypse. It looks to be the case. Um, at the. Vi at the very, at the very least, they'll definitely have an interesting approach, and I don't know. Maybe for maybe for people who who want a sem, who want some semi steampunk in their anime, this will this will fill the niche for a while. But um, the R it says the the RPG's villains are lights who cause significant harm, but the mobile army cores. Now I'm better able to stand up to them. Failure though means the end of the world, and I I I will always I will always be interested in the whole concept of urban fantasy, and this is no exception. So I get the feeling that when that when this when this thing does drop, I'll probably end up watching. Well, once it's once it's subbed, obviously. Hmm. So next, we have a we have a manga adaptation of of, of Sherlock Holmes that's focused on Moriarty of all people. Of course. Um, specifically, it's referred. It's called Moriarty the Patriot. Huh. Dealing with him trying to change an unfair class system in England in the nineteenth century. Uh, Moriarty and his fa and his family adopt two lower class orphans, but instead of living a lavish, pampered life, the two boys suffer cruelly at the hands of Moriarty's family. Ooh. 
This cruelty at the hands of his family seeds a deep hatred of the nobility on Moriarty's art. He recruits the older of the two boys, who has a genius mind and killer instinct, to wage a war against the English nobility, beginning with his own family. His goals seem noble, but his methods in achieving them start to reveal the monster lurking inside of him. It's being animated by Production IG, so they're not going to fuck up on the animation. Yep, Production IG's always got a pretty high standard mm -hmm. of quality. Yep. Um, and the fir the first volume of the, the first volume of the series will be published by Viz on October sixth. Nice. The which is the same week as the anime is go is set to premiere. That makes sense. But the I, for whatever reason I'm getting a um maybe it's just me, but there's a small part of me that's reminded of Gankutsuo. I don't know why. That's I'm not sure either. Now, granted, it's not using the same visual style, but I, th I think that I think this is going to be one that's going to be up my particular alley. Now, I should note that whenever it comes to anime news, that I'm I'm always very selective about what I about what I put what I um, focus on, simply because I don't want to follow trends. Yeah. That's that's why I don't. That's it's not that I it's not, it's not that I wouldn't mind covering more anime topics. It's more of I need to be more selective. So I'm, so I'm not just I'm not just covering. Hey, a new season of this of this already popular series. No, I'm I want to see new boundaries. I can understand that. I remember being uh, very vocal myself during recreators when everybody was just like. I don't know about this. I'm like, no, it's it's fantastic. Go do that. Yeah. Um, because fashion is fleeting. Uh -huh. um, now, Joseph Malazzi has give as has been doing a progress update regarding a regarding a future Stargate series. Um, that they are it is it is being worked on. And Brad Wright is go Brad Wright is going to be involved. Um, I'm I'm apprehensive. I, I wasn't really hugely impressed with the Stargate series past the movie in SG One. Um, but it's, it sounds it sounds for. Even f even with all that they're saying, it sounds like this isn't really earmarked. But it, but what they're probably going to be doing is trying to create a pilot and put that up and have that put out sometime in twenty twenty one. At least that's the vibe that I get. Mm. But e and even so, even so, I will I will admit one thing. It is. It it is it will always be funny to me that those that those fa that those fancy those fancy little staffs are less accurate than a P ninety. <laughs> um, that actually doesn't surprise me. All things considered, a manual a manual weapon of that type would be more unwieldy than a gun designed to be what it is. Of course, a P90 is not a good gun to use anyway. The way the magazine reloads is terrible, and I don't know why they use them. Um, I think the reason they use, I think the reason they're used is because they're cheap. Cheap rule of cool, because they look cool since they're so different from a normal, a normal gun's build, a gun silhouette. Mm -hmm. Um, but it would have been for for a military group like what SG1 was supposed to be. It would have been much more realistic, and I know we're talking realism in a sci-fi show, but still, it would have been much more understandable for the military to use what they already had in surplus, which is M4 carbines. 
I'm guess I'm guessing it's one of the, I'm guessing it's a case of because keep in mind they were filming in Canada and they probably couldn't get M4 carbines <laughs> up there. Or yeah, at least in, at least in that, that part of it, because if that's the case, they're getting all their P90s from France. Oh, the Quebecois must have had a day, a field day, giving these guns over to the production crew. Well, I Quebec think quoi. I think they were. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I think they were. Do I think they were doing filming in BC. Yeah, most filming could either be in Quebec or in BC, depending. Well, what I, what I'm saying is, um, a lot of the P90s probably would have come from Europe, and if they were coming from Europe, they probably would have come from the parts of Europe that aren't the UK, because I believe the UK still uses some very very standard uh, Heckler and Koch um, submachine guns, because the mm -hmm. P90 is a submachine gun. Um, yeah. So it would have probably come from France. And Quebec is, well, French Canada, so Quebec would have gotten the guns over to BC and then also made fun of the people in BC because Quebec thinks they're better than everybody. <laughs> Moving right along because I don't want to I don't want to start a provincial <laughs> fight again. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and let let's be honest, Quebec isn't the Quebec doesn't think that they're better than um nobody in Quebec thinks that they're better than everybody else. It's everybody in Toronto that thinks they're better than everybody else. At least, that, at least that's how at least that's how I see it. Especially when it comes to hockey, even though they haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. Well, aside aside from being Boston's bottom bitch. For fifty years, <laughs> I mean, it, it's not that Quebec says they're better than everyone else. It when you talk to a lot of people from Quebec, they just act so condescending. And He's we're and we're walking and, and we're, we're walking and we're moving right along. Oh. So now we have a case of what I like to call. Trademark is bullshit. <laughs> so last week we talked about Immortals Phoenix Rising, which looks good. It looks really good. And now we find out why they did the name change. I had thought it was because there was the notion that gods and monsters might have been a little too generic. Um, not that no, Immortals so. Phoenix Rising is any better, but at least it's a little bit on point. But apparently the reason why is because Monster Energy decided to cry foul. That doesn't make any sense, though. Yeah, a apparently they are... So, when they filed the Gods and Monsters trademark, it was opposed by Monster Energy, who claimed it could cause confusion with almost all of their trademarks, including Monster Army, Monster Energy Drink, and so on. They state they believe their trademarks would be damaged by gods and monsters, stating in one part, quote, Opposer will be damaged by registration of the applications in that applicant's mark so it res so resembles Opposer's monster marks, including as registered in the PTO, Patent and Trademark Office, and, and, and in which Opposer owns common law trademark likes, rights as to be likely when used on or in connection with the applicant's goods and services as to cause confusion or to cause mistake, or to deceive. Naturally, entire... Ubisoft opposed this. And Ubisoft was right to. Tra trademark only counts... Or, I should say, trademark is only supposed to count when your goods and services are in the same sector. Monster is a drink, an energy drink. They, they deal in beverages. Their trademark doesn't cross over to a video game trademark. So this is this is long, long story short this is Monster Energy Drink being a bitch. Pretty this, much. This is Monster Energy Drink trying to pull a bitch Thesda except bitch Thesda was actually somewhat justified in trying to go after uh Mo Yang for scrolls because that that was a copyright over a trademark. This is this is monster just being retarded. No, 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 no. This is monster being a bitch. 
Mm-hmm. Call it what it is. They're being a bitch. Yeah. Monster like, Energy claimed no, that no, it's no, more. A monster work on monster. Although what I find funny is that Ubisoft denied the. One of the things that Monster Energy claimed was that its marks were famous, which Ubisoft said, says that they deny that their marks are famous. Which... I think that was. I think that's probably what lost them the case. Um, actually, the, actually, they ended up. They ended up just set. They ended up just settling out of court. But more importantly, Ubisoft pointed out that there are many trademarks containing the world mo- containing the word monster in a variety of categories, both internationally and federally. Yeah, there's monster in in numerous trademarked in numerous different things, mm-hmm. um, such as what can I think of? Monster Burger from from uh, there was a game called Burger Monster Joints. Train that debuted a month ago. I don't know if uh, that name was trademarked though, but I do know that I think Red Robin's Monster Burger, which is just their double patty burgers that that is a trademark i i'm not 100 certain but there are trademarks that contain monster whether it's about sizing whether it's about monster flicks or monster games whether it's anything monster of that nature jam. exactly monster trucks the yeah. entire field of monster trucks um <laughs> monster Mon- hunter <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to see. I'd love to see. Monster, I'd love to see Monster Energy's par- parent company try and do try and do this suit with with um, Capcom and see how they last. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you you didn't you didn't include it include. Oh, you did. Oh, I'm happy. We'll get to that. Never mind. I'm just looking at the at the at the Gazette list and I'm like, oh, there it is. The thing that I uh, that I was so excited for, I hyperventilated for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get there. Next, we have the fact that um, Blade Runner twenty twenty nine is get is getting another comic. Um, this is following up on the Titan Comics Blade Runner story that began with twenty nineteen, and is an official sequel to the nineteen eighty two classic. I gotta say, I lo- I love the cover art here. No, and it's written by the sequel movie twenty forty nine screenwriter along with a. Uh... And I don't so, right. care what anybody says, the sequel movie was actually pretty decent. It was a decent movie, but people were letting nostalgia. And they were also, you know, Blade Runner as an, in 1982 did something that up until that point I don't think had really been popularized ever. Yeah. Um, and, of course, we have the ending speech. Uh, infamous, or famous, I should say. It's not infamous. It's not badly known. Mm-hmm. Uh, speech about memory and death that uh Rutger Hauer may he rest uh delivered perfectly just struck you to the core um but no yeah, I, as I it, do think I do think when it came to that people were way too bl- people were way too blinded by nostalgia and if you and the poster child for this sort for the sort of blinded by nostalgia of course would be um Razor Fist cuz I saw I saw his review and I was like man this was a bad take I I don't I don't watch Razor anymore. He's had, there have been too many things he's just been so polarized about because he doesn't want to allow for any other view. Um, I'm, but that's not that's not part of this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Blade Runner twenty forty nine as a movie was actually really good. As a Blade Runner movie, as a cyberpunk movie, mm-hmm. was pretty good. But trying to compare it to the original Blade Runner is a disservice to both movies. Well, it's the, it's the reason why um, I will defend the 2011 Conan movie. I love that movie. I mean, it's, it's, it's just as schlock as the old Conan movies. It's, it's just the same type of, you're getting someone who looks like a strongman to go do stuff and kill things and look fun. Except, I think 2011 Conan d- went a little more serious on the story. But anybody who compares it to... <laughs> How campy are the original Arnold Conan movies? Come on! Let's not let's let's for, let's not forget that. I'll be blunt. A lot of people who were who um who've seen the there is very little in common between the between those movies and the Conan in the books. Oh yeah, no Conan in the books is 
Ooh. Yeah, the books are way different. Um, now that's... Conan the Sumerian is way different. Yeah. Um, so th this particular series, we're getting back to 2029, we'll be dealing with Ahana Ash Ashina as she's hu as she's hunting down renegade replicants. And is challenged by two of them, with one offering salvation and the other deadly damnation. That sounds like a summary I would have given when I was 16. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> on a, apparent, apparently, there's going to be other covers. One of, one of them is from Peach Momoko. One of them is from Giovanni Valletta, who had previously worked on John Wick. And another one is a concept cover from the late Sid Mead. I'm glad that they got one from him before he uh, he passed. Mm -hmm. it's, um, I miss that. I miss that guy. His art was fantastic. I um, I will note that the date that when I found out about his passing if, uh, shortly after that, I did go back and rewatch Turn A Gundam. <laughs> Uh, the mustache Gundam. Which, I think that I think that series gets more flack than it deserves because of the mustache. Because putting aside that, it's decent. It, it is decent. Um, for people who are just watching Gundam to watch robots fight, that that series gets flack because they think that the Turn A Gundam looks goofy because its V fin looks like a giant mustache. For people who have been serious about Gundam in a more in-depth way, people who you know look into the lore, the politics, have fun with character arcs, it, it sometimes got flack for tr attempting to combine all Gundam worlds. That's what the, the Black History was supposed to be. That, oh, hey, we explain that everything from any other Gundam timeline can be found here just by saying, oh... Uh, the Moonlight Butterfly happened, and Black History. So any technology from that time and the history from that time is gone, but you know some technology survived because the nano machines didn't reach it, and uh, and so we have things like the X Gundam having the the fucking God Hand, the God Finger. <laughs> yeah, trying trying to com trying to combine a trying to combine a bunch of different um a bunch of different series at once like that was punching above weight. I think Tamina was just having a schizophrenic episode. <laughs> when you're at it for that long, I can't blame him. So next I um I wanted to I wanted to give a bit of I I was considered I know some people are gonna throw out Boyega because because of him because of him supporting um BLM, although um I'd say he's I'd say he's dialed back on that went as time as time went by. When we started getting more more information on that particular front, and BLM started becoming a brand, a but, brand and and a somewhat um, we fucking called it. Well, you can't. I'm go, I'm going to say this. You can't blame John Boyega for wanting to support the message. No, um, absolutely. Yeah. And while the message to me is one that is slightly redundant. Only because, yes, we know that there is sometimes a problem with law enforcement that overstretch their bounds. And yes, there can also be a problem on the other end of that spectrum, that there are problem people everywhere. It's not something you necessarily need to, you know, burn down cities over. <laughs> and I think it's when, when that started happening that he's like, uh, uh, I message good, these people not. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Um, but a apparently, he was Joe Malone's global amb global ambassador. Um, and the reason the reason why he decided to who decided to quit was because he found out that for the Chinese ad campaign, despite using Boyega's personal video and story that feature his family and friends, they replaced him. With, in the Chinese version with Liu Hauran. And I 
I'm confused here. Is there so? Is, I know, I know. We, we when we when stuff like this ha happens, like they they like were accused of being of whitewashing a character, but would that technically count as like a Chinese washing of a thing? Yep, yellow wash. Yep, and this isn't the first time this has happened. In fact, this well, happens a lot. With, with the CCP, it's expected. Oh yeah, and I mean. His his re his reasoning for his reasoning for deciding to back to back out of the ambra uh, ambassador thing is he did not care for his story being used, but him be but him being exited out, and it was more he he didn't have to back out, but it was more of a integrity thing for him. Well, and that makes perfect sense. It was his. This wasn't just like a generic story he told. It was a story of him. It was his personal all. It was all about him. It was yeah. his thing, and so he he backed yeah. out because they stole. They essentially they stole it from him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now of course, now of course, now of course, um, the com the uh, com the company get issued a statement to the Hollywood Reporter that was a non apology, and said that they removed the. The local version of the campaign. We recognize that was painful, and the offense and what offense was caused. You know, you know how it is. It's um, the weasel words. It's, yeah, it's weasel. Um, and he had he had remarked the following, saying, "I've decided to step down as Joe Malone's global ambassador. When I joined the brand as their first male global ambassador last year, I created the short film we used to launch the campaign. It won the Fragrance Foundation Virtual Awards 2020 for best media campaign." Their decision to replace my campaign in China by using my concepts and substituting a local brand ambassador for me without either my consent or prior notice was wrong. The film celebrated my personal story, showcasing my hometown, including my friends and featuring my family. While many brands understandably use a variety of global and local ambassadors, dismissively trading out one's culture this way is not something I can condone. It's back to back, but I assure you this will be dealt with swiftly. I don't have time for this nonsense. We press on and strong. Stay blessed, people. Yeah, and uh, with their... Uh, so, uh, something I, I wanted to say uh, as a side note to their, their non-pology. Um, it's the same type of weasel words that anyone who's been in a customer service type job has used. Mm -hmm. Taking no, no responsibility and apologizing for anything that, that other people may be feeling. While at the same time doing nothing. Yeah. Uh, he he was he probably turned down a fair a fair amount of money for this, so good on him. While some of his while there may be some of his his personal opinions that people don't agree with, some of us here included. He at least seems to stick to his convictions, and there's nothing I can, nothing bad I can say about that. Someone who sticks to their guns and isn't a hypocrite about them, it's always laudable. Even if what they're sticking to is terrible, it's still a laudable trait. This is not a terrible thing to stick to, so it's even better. So next we have um, a bit a bit of a Metroidvania that's heading to the Switch. It's already it's already been out for about a year on um, on PC via Steam and GOG, but now the Switch is getting the treatment. It's a little game called Cathedral. It's a fun little game too. And yeah, we're going for, we're going eight we're going full on eight bit with this. Although whenever I see towns like that, I keep thinking of um, I keep thinking of Zelda two, and I keep wondering if I can um, get some health. <laughs> Go and drink her water, monk. <laughs> but. <sighs> I have I have to wonder if um if Yacht Club Games was acting as a consultant at any point because 
There's a few parts in this that feel that keep reminding me of Shovel Knight. Not the least of which being the uh, the cover art. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were inspired by Shovel Knight or Yacht Club games. That's certainly a possibility. The game um, Shovel Knight's been around long enough to to kind to kind of spawn inspirations in that regard. Um, And <laughs> Shovel Knight's what, 2014? 2015? Somewhere around that area, yeah. It's been around a while, and it got all those free additions that were super good. Oh man. Those were all free! And they and they were all really good. Although I suppose I suppose another thing that may have been taking notes that they may have been taking notes from is the messenger. True. Although, hopefully this game won't piss me off as much as The Messenger did at times. Might be Nintendo hard, which is why it's going on the Nintendo Switch. Damn right. <laughs> so then we have Monster Hunter Rise, and I'm guessing this is the... <laughs> Someone have to... Jesus. <laughs> when, I, when I said I, I nearly hyperventilated for two hours, I wasn't joking. Um... On a personal, on a personal, uh, a personal chat on Discord with some friends of mine, uh, I saw the trailer, and my all the typed chat I had for the next hour was just gushing, literally just gushing, over the reveal trailer and the gameplay stuff that we got from the direct. So, uh, I I was not expecting this. At all. In fact, most Monster Hunter fans were not expecting this at all. And uh, the fact that this comes out March 26th is infinite amounts of hype for me. Because there are things. I could gush about this game forever. But <laughs> just from what we've seen. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that now instead of just Palicos, we have Palamutes. Dog Companions. That alone is is a super upgrade. And <sighs> going back going back to the east, which hasn't which hasn't been done since Portable Third. Um, I guess this I guess this is the this is the world telling us, hey, you may not be able to get a Tokid in three, but at least you'll get this. And I'm gonna be honest, the the Tokid in games, while inspired by Monster Hunter, just aren't Monster Hunter, and. There's a, there's a feeling to Monster Hunter that none of the Monster Hunter alikes have been able to perfectly replicate. Maybe that's um, for the best, and because I'd rather instead that they do their, their own thing. thing. Yeah, because, uh, for example, with the God Eater series, one of the, another big um, Monster Hunter alikes, uh, God Eater 1 tried very hard to replicate the sort of zoning, but they, they also wanted to make their own thing. And so the zones were were more like they are in world, big areas separated by small tributaries that go between the big areas, and mm -hmm. there weren't loading gates. But from from there to two to three, it's all it's become more and more its own thing. And now God Eater is God Eater. It's not, oh, this is a thing like Monster Hunter, but in a post apocalyptic sci fi world. Yeah. And it, um, lo it looks like it looks like they're they I saw what looks like there might be some hints of um, some new, either some new or some in, or some different spins on weapon types. Um, I'll have to send this to I'll have to send this to the Soulbound team. And um, when it comes to when it comes to the armor set that that was shown that was shown a second ago, um, if I had the money, I would totally cosplay that. Which, which one? Uh, which weapon? Um, or timestamp. As far as as far as the weapon thing, um, I don't, I can't, I can't do the timestamp. But it looked, it looked like there was some, there was some version of the, each, of the charge blade that was going a bit scythe-y. Oh, that's um gun lance. That's a gun lance actually. Oh, that's a scythe on a gun lance. Um, okay, I, me... I stand, I stand corrected. Doesn't uh, look how I typically expect gun lances to look though. Well, if you look, if you pause it after he does the dash forward with the wire bug, um, where when the scythe is in front of him, you'll see that it's a very large tubic, tubular 
um, stack that the scythe is in. Um, and, and that's how you know it's a gun lance. As, um, far as, as far as the palamutes, I'm perfectly fine with that because that means it'll be that that going that going between areas will be a lot more interesting. So, so uh, I, I have a, a a quick fan rundown I have to go through with all all the nice features um, that we know of so far. Go ahead. If you'll allow me to. Um, first of all, the palamutes, uh, they are more of an attack type help, uh, helper and they're also your traversal type helper, whereas the palicos are more a support type helper. Mm -hmm. um, you can have two dogs, two cats, or one dog and one cat. And even if you're on a four person hunt, everyone can have at least one animal. So you can have eight entities in a hunt now. Um, the wire bug is essentially uh, aerial style from generations on crack. Because you can use the wire bug just about anytime, anywhere, for anything. Um, and you can actually see that in some of the combat stuff here. Uh, the, the wire bug isn't the only new movement thing either. You can climb anything in this game, much like Breath of the Wild. Um, and for that, they've made the, the maps a lot more vertical. And they've made a lot of little hidden areas you can find while exploring. They really want to emphasize some map exploration here. Which they were kind of, they were kind of pivoting a little bit into with World introducing some degrees of um, verticality that weren't in previous games. Mm -hmm. Well, and this this has the um, the way some YouTubers, uh, for example, one uh, specifically Rage Gaming videos I watch. Mm -hmm. um, said is that it looks like what monster hunter is trying to do is to give each monster hunter its own unique feel from now on um we have we have one through try one through three that all have their the basic same feel except we got underwater combat in three which didn't work too well on anything but the wii um wii control is really good for for water combat then in four we got uh, mounting, and we got you know the last few sets of weapons now that we're at the full 14. Who knows, they may add more. Uh, with Generations, we got the the Hunter Styles and Hunter Arts. With World, we got the open world with no loading gates. You took away some of the standing animations you used to do, taking items. Uh, things were more expansive. You had interactions between monsters. And now with Rise, we seem to be e even more going to towards its own thing. Um, full traversal of the map, more monsters, larger areas, uh, a, a, essentially an infinite grappling hook you can use. It looks like twice bef before you have to let it recharge on ground. Um, and it's all looking like, well, we have this one style of Monster Hunter games. Then we go to the world style is where the first big change went. And then this, while it has some elements of world, is still it's mostly its own thing. And the, the, the theory and the hope going forward is that each Monster Hunter, each main series Monster Hunter, because I'm guessing Rise is probably going to be a main series, um, is going to be its own unique thing. It's going to have its own unique flavor, its own unique mechanics, and maybe some mechanics from a previous one are carried to the next, but not all of or most of. And which, so I'm... That's good, which... Um... That's going. That's going to create some divisiveness. So this is a bold strategy. Let's see how it pays off. I. I I'm a super veteran. I've been around <laughs> since Monster Hunter One. Mm -hmm. I've seen the changes since the PlayStation Two and the PSP. There were a lot of people who were who are and were my friends. Some of my friends are not my friends because of Monster Hunter World, which was dumb. But whatever. Um who didn't like the changes in world. They're like, this just trivializes the dance with monster and hunter you had. I'm like, it changes it. It doesn't trivialize it. So and in sure, other words, they're purists. Yeah, they were purists. And I, and I said, so here are the negatives you're talking about, but I don't hear you reacting about any of these other changes or quality of life upgrades that we got, such as, um, you know, tracking certain things on the map, track uh, a wish list for your, for your weapons and armor, 
things like that. And they would never respond because they didn't have anything to rebut against those things. Um, sure, there are going to be purists, probably in each and every generation, who go, oh, this new change is terrible. The, the, the last one was the best. Mm -hmm. You get that with every game as a series. I mean, yeah. I remember when that happened with Resident Evil 4. I remember when it happened with Resident Evil 6, which, by the way, Resident Evil 6, terrible as a Resident Evil game, pretty okay as an action game. Um, it's, so, six has got six has gotten kind of a renaissance among, among certain among certain groups where it's starting to get a reevaluation. Well, no matter what, as a Resident Evil game, it does not meet the mark. It doesn't re meet RE standards, but. You've got four types of gameplay in there that are all very unique and all very well done, just not to the highest extent, which is what people were expecting. It's a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none situation. Mm -hmm. um, but this Monster Hunter Rise, <laughs> I'm going to get back to this so that we can move on. Uh, I, I, the final thing that I know of is that the using wire bugs in battle thing is going to be a huge thing for everybody especially sword and shield i'm sure you saw that part where the guy in sword and shield just attached his sword to a wire bug and mm -hmm. flailed it about <laughs> yeah my reaction when i first saw that was they finally made sword and shield cool again because sword for the <laughs> longest time it seemed like sword and shield was treated as the as treated as um baby's first um loadout Baby's first loadout, or if you were in high play game, best support because it could use items while its shield was out. Um, and then in Iceborne, everybody could use items while their weapon was out. And the only thing that Sword and Shield had going for it was it could Shoryuken with the Clutch Claw. <laughs> so this is. I don't know how Capcom does it. And I don't know whether this is because I think they keep, um, I think they keep optioning, uh, what was his name? Uh, guy who's the head of Dragon's Dogma. Um, I think they keep optioning him for to come on to other other projects and help with them. Uh, Itsuno Hideaki Itsuno. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if he was if I know he I don't think he was on World World was a almost brand new team and they did really well but he was on devil may cry 5 and everybody thought oh that's going to be dragon's dogma 2 when they heard that itsuno was involved and then <laughs> i remember v filled to the brim with people going it's not devil may cry 5 quit dreaming guys and then it was devil may cry 5 and there was just the in the loudest shout from us dmc fans going get dunked on no, like legit. Oh, I, I'm the, I don't blame you. <laughs> um, and spe so, and speaking of that, we'll probably be talking about Itsuno li later. But next, um, <laughs> so it looks like we got some more footage for Death Loop, which um, I I like Arcane. I want to be optimistic about Death Loop, but. Given some of the behind the scenes info that's been that's been trickling down over the over the last ten months, I'm a little um cautious. Oh, is this that one where the guy is stuck in a time loop and he has to do an assassin job? Mm-hmm. Eight targets oh, and one rival assassin. The real question is, can you can you kill the rival assassin as part of that to prevent her from stopping you? Um, I think I think the I think when it comes to the rival assassin, they're they're under the same under the same looping rules as you. So if you kill them, the loop the loop starts. <laughs> no, they'll no, they'll just come back. When the loop starts, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that seems interesting. But the problem the problem that I'm having with this is with something like this is that um 
They've been very good at in, at integrating narrative and gameplay, and something like Deathloop is very clearly designed around gameplay and not and only gameplay. When you do a time loop mechanic in a game, I don't always feel that that's the case. Sure, gameplay is going to be a heavy element, but you'll be able to hear the stories of people around the setting you're in. Mm -hmm. And like Hitman, like you go through a Hitman level and you hear stories and you're like, oh, I could probably do this level that way. And so you retry the level and do it again. This would actually be tied in to the mechanics. You'd hear that story and be like, oh, that's a way I could kill that visionary. And you'll also heal... You'll, here's, the pro along... here's the problem, though. Um, they're going... They're going semi roguelike with with the with the um with the time loop. Now that doesn't make any sense. If you're in a time loop, there shouldn't be a roguelike element until you change something. And that, so, like, there was there was a rumor go, going about that um, Zenimax was trying is trying to push Arcane to go more into live service style gameplay. That's why I'm a little bit worried, especially since. There was there was the fact that um um, Dis um death of the outsider that Dishonored two DLC ended up bombing so hard that they decided to put Dishonored on ice. I will mm. say I I like the um I like the seventies aesthetic that Deathloop has. Yeah, looks pretty good. Okay. Kind of reminds me of of old of um old school James Bond or the Man from Uncle. <laughs> the Man from Uncle, yeah. Okay. No, I am. Um, I like the idea of the game. Uh, I'm tentatively optimistic, but I'm tentatively optimistic about a lot of games and. Many of them I never play because, well, you can be tentatively optimistic, but not a um, not surprised that it doesn't live up to expectations when that happens. Yeah, they're shooting for second quarter twenty twenty one, so we'll see. Um, then we ended up getting some show some showcase gameplay for Spider Man Miles Morales. And we found out that we now f for a while I had thought that in order to, in order to get this you had to get the PS5 um, version of uh, Spy of Insomniac Spider-Man. Nope, this particular add-on is coming to the PS4 version as well. Ooh! So good save on that on their part there. I'm still kind of iffy ab about. I still don't like how they tr how they tried to build this as its own as its own thing and then and then dialed back and said nope it's ju it's a um it's just it's just a um, it's an expansion because it's not just DLC it's its own big arc so it's definitely an expansion pack. Mm -hmm. God, remember when they used to call them expansion packs? You re we really only get expansion packs these days in um, strategy games. Those aren't really expansion packs. Those are just things that should have been in the game from the beginning. I know just some guy doesn't care doesn't care for miles, but I'd I'd say um I when it comes to Miles Morales as a character, I'd I'd say re, I'd say more re, more recent years have done a better job at redeeming him. And especially into the Spider Verse, did a better job at it. Uh -huh. Um. That said, both Miles and Mary Jane were the worst were the worst parts of the PS of um Insomniac Spider Man. Mostly because they're tr mostly because they're trying to do forced stealth in in um a in a means that doesn't complement the rest of the sandbox. Yeah, it's it's like the reason why the why the um, fortress is the why the fortress early on is the worst part of Wind Waker. Yeah, enforced stealth in a game that isn't suited towards it. Mm -hmm. 
That's not to say you can't do stealth in, in Spider-Man. It's more, it's more the fact that doing stealth in this very limited manner that they were going with doesn't work. Yeah. Um... And to be to be honest, some something that I had I had suggested at one point, and I'm not sure if it's, it would ever end up happening, is a sequel where you where you control both Parker and Miles, and switch the, between the two. Well, sw switch bet switch between the two, and the two of them having different styles, kind of what we're getting with Gotham Knights. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, I can see that. And then again, that concept started with GTA Five. When you think about it. Even earlier than that, there are a lot of games where switching between people who have their own branching story paths and styles exist. Mm -hmm. The Saga Frontier games did that. If we're going to go back far enough. Yeah. It's, a, it's, not a, it's not a new thing, but it's also not something executed very often because it's often hard to execute well. Although I don't remember Miles Morales having electricity powers. Yeah, but I also don't remember Peter Parker having a Doc Ock suit. <laughs> I'd rather not talk about Superior Spider-Man. <laughs> 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 what? That doesn't exist. I don't know what you're talking about. Unless you were referring to Iron Spider. That's a different matter entirely. <laughs> Uh, no, um, although I do have to say, side note, uh, Yuri Lowenthal makes the most convincing Peter Parker I've seen in Spider-Man, in live, act or live, um, non-graphic novel Spider-Man media. Better than any of the cinematic Spider-Mans. Although um, I do, I do have a soft spot for Josh, for Josh Keaton with Spectacular. Especially True. when he did those videos where he was reading spider memes. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, yeah. But I, I just... Yuri Lowenthal has always been typecast as the... Almost as the angsty teenager. The angsty, rebellious teenager. Mm -hmm. Sasuke, Haseo... Um, you name it. I, there's a lot of things Yuri Lowenthal has been that I've that have been the angsty, rebellious team. Yeah. Um, and then as Peter Parker, he just blooms. His his Peter Parker was super believable. So I'm, I, I he's my favorite. He's my favorite Spider Man. I'll put it yeah. that way. Um, and it and. When it comes to the combat footage that we that we saw of, of Miles, um, that is that was he's looking way too he's looking a bit um, overpowered. Well, if it's an expansion and it happens after the end of the of the actual game, he likely has upgrades that carry over from Peter. And he's and we're also dealing with um, him ha him having camouflage. Yep. Which, given the fact that he that he was already able to jury rig some jury rig some equipment in the original story, not too surprising. Especially when Peter starts helping him. Mm -hmm. But as far. But uh, although I didn't think that when we saw a gameplay demonstration that was going to involve um, dealing with a wrecked up Br Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> yeah. Got a, br a bridge in Brooklyn I'm willing to sell you if you believe that. <laughs> Man, do you remember when that actually used to be a saying that meant something? Pepperidge Farm remembers. I remember. I'm sticking with the Pepperidge Farm one because I don't want to give South Park any credit. Thank you. You're welcome. I like giving South Park credit where credit is due. And while the I member grapes aren't a thing that are, that is where credit is due, I'll give it a 
a lot of credit on other things. Yeah. But at the very least, since this since this expansion is coming to PS4, I might I might grab that version. Um I probably will. Uh, I already have Insomniac Spider-Man, so mm -hmm. and but... it's super good. <laughs> oh yeah. Speaking of things that are good, let's talk about DMC5 Special Edition. Which to me was inevitable. I mean, yeah. I think I knew this was I knew this was coming and Yes, I yes it can be stated that I am a fucking idiot that because I because I bought the vanilla version instead of waiting for a special edition, but um I wasn't going to wait for a goddamn special edition. Are you kidding me? <laughs> My patience I got it can only on go so far. Yeah. I had zero patience. I had been playing the hell out of DMC4 special edition on PC, which I paid for after buying DMC4 on mm -hmm. PC. I've I have paid Ex I've paid for both a vanilla and special edition since DMC three each time, and, and I'm happy. I'm happy to. If I'm happy to. If in this, if some, if somebody is looking at looking at this and assuming I'm get, I'm gonna be getting special edition just so I can play as Virgil. You're goddamn right. You <laughs> seriously, pay, seriously, pay the fuck attention, people. Hold on, we 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 we. Boys, you, you do know we do have a button for this particular situation. If I can uh, find it, I will play it. Ah. Give it a time to load up. Winamp is being a dick again. Uh, you're a man of culture as well, I see. Winamp is best. Happy New Year. <laughs> there it is. Yep. So... <laughs> We're getting both that. We're getting um, turbo mode, which is probably going to work the same way as turbo mode in four, and legendary dark knight mode. Which, if it's anything like four, it's uh, son of Sparta mode with twenty times the enemies. Well, they said challenge the hordes, so yeah. Um, well, and of course, we're still getting bloody palace, but that was we already have bloody never... palace. Yeah. Um, the thing that I find interesting with it, with this particular approach is that Virgil seems seems to aside from the fact that there se he seems to have some special he seems to have some combos that allow him to switch out with V. Um, there's the fact that it look it looks like he also has access to doppelganger. That doesn't surprise me. He had some moves that allowed him to do doppelganger in four. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, doubt I, think the even virtual... I doubt the um, concentration gimmick from four will be coming back, though. Probably not. I mean, but... I, it would be welcome if it did, and I know that there's going to be some people ra raising a stink because um, some um, pe some people on the PC end of things did manage to hack it so you could play as Virgil, but um, that. Per, that particular mod was unstable. Yeah, it crashed the game a lot. Mm -hmm. I tried it out for a little while. It also didn't really feel as fluid as I'm sure this Virgil is going to be. What I th I think I think the um I think it was more I think it was more of they had they had plans in place to make Virgil play make Virgil playable, but they didn't have enough time. Yeah, probably. Or Capcom just wanted to... Capcom makes a lot of good decisions, and then sometimes they make one bad decision amongst all those good decisions, mm -hmm. such as, oh, we'll make Virgil later and make some more money on top of it. Uh, and it's crap. I'm, le I'm Be leaning more towards the not, not, having enough, not having enough time to actually put him in, because we saw, th we saw this previously with... Um... With J with Jill in Marvel vs. Capcom three, where she was technically on the disc, but she was glitchy as all hell. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, um, I know. Plus, some the thing the thing that I've learned when it comes to game development is they'll still even you you need to have people working on something even after the game goes gold. Otherwise, they're otherwise they're just going to go to other projects. Yep. 
No, I am. Um, so, my 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 stance on this is, from what it looks like, special edition for PC players who already have normal is only going to add Virgil Turbo Mode, Legendary Dark Knight, and 120 FPS because we have everything else already. Um, which, if they aren't charging full price for people who already have the game, because they've done that before. They didn't mm -hmm. charge full price for Devil May Cry 4 Special Edition for people who already had Devil May Cry 4 on Steam. I got that at, at a discount. If they do the same thing for Devil May Cry 5 Special Edition, I will have zero problems putting down that money. I will take it. I will eat it because it's an entire new character to go through a bunch of story and a, and a bloody palace and just have a grand old time being stylish as hell while killing with a katana and being the edgiest bastard this side of a of well the grim dark universe of 40k. I'm I'm looking forward to what to what the to what the pros like Dongari are gonna do are gonna do with Virgil. Uh, oh, I wonder if we're going. Oh, I haven't checked. I I completely spaced checking that. I wonder if true style tournaments are happening again, especially with COVID. I'll have to ch I'll have to check because those were fun times. Now next we have a case of. I fucking called this. <laughs> oh God. I had we I had stated a while back that that, le that that leaked image was gonna turn into was gonna turn into something, and lo and behold, it did. Ah. Nice. And this is this is being developed by Avalanche, i.e. the people behind the Just Cause games. I'm gonna be honest. Just Cause games can be fun, but uh, they get boring real quick. Um, so this is taking place during the during Hogwarts in the 1800s, where you're apparently not only a new student but able to use ancient magic. Um, and to be to be honest, in in open in open wor in open world, um, in open world Hogwarts is something that I had wanted for a long time and now I'm finally getting it. So I'll so I'll be curious to see how it how it plans how it pans out. I do think it's funny that um this is this had the unfortunate timing of coming right along the same time that uh, that all that all the fanboys and fangirls are but are but hurt at um Rowling over her, over over the uh, character in her recent book. To, and what I found especially funny about that whole thing was that they were burning her old books in protest. <laughs> what I find funny about that is these are the same people that got on that got on um, football fans for burning jerseys after the whole kneeling thing, saying, "Well, you already you already gave them your money, so what's the point?" And I have to and I got banned from one group by saying, "We already gave Rowling her money, so what's the so what's the point?" I uh, uh, the people, the people so obsessed that they would burn those books because Rowling said things they dislike. I just, I look, look at them and I shake my head. Look, the way I see it, boys, it's very simple. You don't like what Rowling says? Don't burn the books. Keep them. They're still good books. But in the next time she says, oh, I got a new book, by the way, everybody. You know what you do? You look at the book at the store. You put the book down. You leave the bookstore. You pick up another book. Yeah, here's the, the problem. Here's the these people is simple. You hurt their fucking wallet. Here's the, here's the thing, though. The people who are raising a stink, they don't read. They probably, <laughs> they probably only knew about, knew about, the, knew about Potter through the, um, through the movies. You know, Monk, you could have just stopped it. They don't read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's pretty much it. Much like how Critical Role fans don't play D&D. &D. Oh! Critical oh. Role fans don't play. There, there have been some horror stories I've heard about some Critical Role fans trying to play D&D. Oh, I, I've had I've had to be in I've had to I've had some of them at my table and um they don't they don't um they um they didn't last 
because they, because they because they decided to pull the Matt Mercer excuse on, on me and um, they they expect, I am, they expect every GM to be Matt Mercer, which is just. I think the other mm. the other thing is I think they were expecting me to softball them. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm sorry, softball is that is that a is that a game little girls play? Monk, be honest with me. Did you softball me when I first started playing with you guys? Nope. <laughs> Maddie, Maddie, I have to ask. Why did you ask a question that you already knew the answer to? I think it was rhetorical. Rhetorical in, in the sense of we're trying to establish a, a, a thing here. Besides, this is a podcast. We get podcasts and there will be this one idiot that if I don't ask, they're going to ask. But do do we listen to the idiots? Not really. I mean, the idiots let us into us. <laughs> Speak, no, speaking speaking no speaking of wonderful, smart human beings. Mm -hmm. Speaking of speaking of 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 which, um. So, Final Fantasy sixteen is is going to be a thing. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, so that's what this explosion over the whole PS5 announcement thing happened. And I Say did again, find a, I did find out that they that um Itsuno is going to be involved with this. With that, uh with Devil May Cry Five or with uh with Final Fantasy Sixteen, he is going to be involved and. Already, the traditionalists are butt hurt because of the fact that we're not that um one we're not doing turn based and two, it se it seems that the it seems that the approach we're going is um is I, a, is possibly a return to Evil East, but I'm not I can't confirm that. A Capcom developer and director is working on a Square game. My flippant comment the first time I saw the the uh, the the trailer was, "Wow, I didn't know we were going Final Fantasy Devil May Cry. I didn't know I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I was right. Welcome I didn't know how right I was." Thing. Again. Imagine you will. This is a good Twilight Zone. I like this Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. You know, for all the bullshit 2020 has put us through, I like this part of 2020. This news is all good. There is one line that um that I that I need to specifically call out for that people that people have been that people have been doing that's been pissing me off. I've been seeing people jump around saying, "Yay, it's going back to its roots and actually being a fa actually being fantasy." Let me burst that particular bubble right fucking now. I'm afraid I'll have some bad news. Thank you. <laughs> Final Fantasy what? from day one has not been the traditional fantasy that some people want to romanticize it was. We had airships <laughs> in the first fucking game. And hovercraft. Starting with, with um, Japanese steampunk since the 80s. All in your favorite game of all, and by the way, your favorite game of all time. Uh, to, I'm speaking not to you two, but uh, to the Marks who think uh, we're going back to fantasy. What the fuck ten was? What the fuck do you think ten was? I'm going back to the, I'm going back to the original. The ori the ori the original was was as much of a um, smattering of di of different fa different fantasy styles than as much as much as all the other ones were. The Trying to trying to say that there was ever some point where it was where it was straight fantasy is bullshit. Even, Every game somebody... has had has had airships. Every game, there has never been a game of Final Fantasy that has not had, in one way, shape, or form, a flying machine that is like the airships. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, in a game like uh, Seven, it was a diesel punk airship, and sure, in Eight, it was a it was a freaking space age spaceship, but you have an airship all the way in one through six. You have an airship in nine. You have multiple airships. There's a city that's an airship. Um, well, at least the top part of the city is an airship. 
In, in the sequel to 10, you actually flew an airship. We don't talk about 10 2. That game doesn't exist. Putting that oh. aside, the point is, the point is, is that people seem to have this people seem to have this notion. People seem to have this notion that the that um that ever that before the PS1 era, that it was traditional medieval fantasy. And <laughs> not the case. And anybody who really thinks that needs to have their head examined because Let's consider all the Magitek stuff that was in six, all the yeah. all the all the weird stuff from other styles of fantasy that's always been in there. The fact that there have been so many different um, cultural nods in Final in Final Fantasy to the point where um, I'm surprised I'm surprised no I'm surprised nobody what nobody looked at Gilgamesh and Fate and went, is that a Final Fantasy reference? Um, <laughs> He's not bumbling enough in Fate to be a Final Fantasy reference. That's the problem. Yeah, the other th the other thing to note is that s some people are saying that this looks too much like fourteen. Um, Yoshi P is producing. Yep, and we have um, a hint that uh, Soken might out actually be the o on the OST as well. Yeah, also, the trailer I... music is very inspired or so Soken inspired. Excuse me. Yeah. Um... Also, I do I do have to do a slight correction. It wasn't Itsuno; it was Hiroshi Takai who's directing. Okay, okay. But I was gonna I was gonna say, but um, Takai has the when it comes to when it comes to what Takai's um been been involved been in been involved in, um, he's all he's also done. He's also been re he's also been responsible for a fair amount of stuff with um. With a realm, with a realm reborn, he and he was also the battle director and battle effect designer for Romancing Saga one and three, and has done has been doing art has been doing art for quite a while. Cause it's not like he's it's not like he's some some ran, some random ass guy. Oh he's, no, he's not. He's been he's been around for he's been around for a while. He and, did a um. He did a very underrated game from Square that I felt never got the recognition it deserved. The Bouncer. I still have my copy of that game. I unfortunately have my copy stolen from me, and I never could find another one. And the Bouncer is of is very much an, is very much underrated. It it deserved way more recognition than it got. Yeah. But it so many people were used to Square being the RPG machine. And nobody paid attention to it. You know, even even though a lot of people tend to forget that th that Square's first entry on the PS One was a fighting game. <laughs> uh, oh, or, man. or the or the fact that um that this was that this was the same this was the same company that gave us front that gave us our um favorite Wanzers. Yep, and that is how you say it. Anyone who tells you otherwise is wrong. <laughs> Wanzers. Yeah. Yeah. Front. I'm referring, of course, the front mission. Front mission. Even though, um, yeah. let's not talk about Left Alive. <laughs> that game hurt me. Where did, Where did Left Alive touch you? Show us on the doll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fuck you too. <laughs> so. Next, we have Ginga Force, which is head, which is heading to PC and PS4 later this month. And what I see out of this is we're doing a ver we are doing a vertical shoot 'em up, but it looks like there's going to be some some quirks involved. Um, at the very least, this doesn't look like it's going to be a bullet hell. It's certainly going to be fa it's certainly going to be fast paced, but it's not going it's not going full on bullet hell. Thank God. Thank God, but bullet hells are so much fun. Look, I like a challenge, but I ain't a masochist. And I played Toho, so I can't say that. <laughs> but it also. Well, one thing it looks like this is going to have in its favor is being able to customize our loadouts. So that'll 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 bring some fun. That will be fun.
especially since do, having custom loadouts means there's going to be an a excuse to do to uh, replay. Of course, you can choose different ways of playing the game and see how your play style carries you through each each time. Mm -hmm. That's going to be fun. Let's see, and we're apparent we apparently have three different ship types, and we have and we have weapon customizations between. Main, sub, and special weapons. Mmm, tasty customization options. I'm a sucker for customization, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, next one, and this one we talked about last year during the E3 special. Ghost Runner is coming out next month, and this one I am looking forward to. Oh, uh, yeah, I, uh... <laughs> I, I have it on, I have it pre-ordered on GOG. Is <laughs> the idea of do the idea of doing a par a parkour cyberpunk ninja? Yeah, I'm all in on that. It comes out just before Cyberpunk 2077. You play through this as a way to whet your appetite before Cyberpunk 2077 comes out. Well, ain't that a coinky dick, huh? I don't think that was planned. I think that just ended up happening because um, 2077 oh. went through some delays. Yep, because it kept getting pushed back. Still, it's a coincidence. That's what I'm calling it. Mm -hmm. It is a coincidence. That's true. Um, it's a hell of a coincidence. But I, uh, I, I uh, distinctly recall saying that I distinctly recall saying during the E3 special that I feel like speedrunners are going to have a field day with this game. Yeah, I've seen some. Uh, I really want to. This is this is outright the, the your your character is a street samurai from Shadowrun almost entirely. Uh, they have a monomolecular katana and superhuman reflexes and would you say all that street samurai stuff. or adept? Actually, I take that back. He's got he's got he's got cyberware, so he doesn't qualify as an adept. Yep, he's a street I samurai. Could, I could see this game showing up at, at a GDQ within a year and a half mm -hmm. uh, of release. Yeah, especially see since. Apparently, one of the things that you're gonna that you're gonna have to deal with is um, one hit, one kill, for both you and the enemy. Yep, one hit, one kill mechanics make the combat fast and intense. Use your superior mobility and frequent checkpoints to fearlessly engage in a never-ending dance with death. Which means that I th I think we're gonna be seeing speed speed runs not just for time but for no but for um. No There's definitely going to be any 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 percent no death runs are going to be because very popular. In most in most video games, you already you always have two categories with any percent and one hundred percent. One hit KO any percent. One hit KO one hundred percent. There's there's possibilities here, man. Mm -hmm. Um, I also am gonna. It's it's also another case where I can throw where I can throw th I can throw this in um, the face of some of somebody like the Blob. Because he he tried to claim that a first person platformer can't work. Did he never play Mirror's Edge? Like, he don't said get me that wrong. Mirror's Edge was his, his example of why it doesn't work. If you could see my face right now, it would be the same as Jackie's. My brain is full of fuck face. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no, he he's using Mirror's Edge as an example that that, that doesn't work, and yet Mirror's Except Edge was actually a decent game. Mirror's Edge was a fantastic parkour game. I loved playing that game. It was one of the, the few things I couldn't actually hold against EA. Now, someone should, someone should tell the blob. I'm, I'm assuming if we talk about the blob, we're talking about Movie Bob, right? Mm -hmm. Someone should tell the uh, Movie Bob the minute the minute uh, Yahtzee Croshaw of Zero Punctuation retires from his gig from from, from the Escapist. Movie Bob is fucked. Oh, he's he's been he's been fucked for a while. If you've if you've seen his Twitter, he's gone full on unhinged. Oh, when was he's know, been unhinged I'm since 2014? What are you talking about? Also, also, um, some somebody sent me a scanned version of his book. Ew. It's as bad as it. It was so that book was so bad that Play for Real, who usually is a a parody site, couldn't parody it. I, if it were me, I would offload that that scan onto a thumb drive. Uh, whatever drive it was on, I would run through 
numerous uh, file deletion and uh, randomizer systems, and then I would burn the thumb drive. That's unclean. You should not have it on your computer, Monk. I don't have it anymore. That was on my old computer. Oh, good. Oh, you're, you're safe. You're safe. If, if nothing else, you should have downloaded it into a in, into a virtual <laughs> into a virtual machine. You don't want to be infected with the blobs' idiocy. Yeah, well, unfor unfortunately, that that computer had a um had a bit of had a bit of an issue, and it's and it's and it was completely kaput. So I bet it was I bet it was the blobs book. The blobs book no, killed maybe. your computer. So <laughs> we're getting a third amnesia. And this time it's by the people who are act who actually know a thing or two about horror. Frictional Games is is covering it, so there's some hope. Eh, I'm a. I'm gonna be honest. I've never found horror as a genre really enticing. It's been boring for me. Well, um, the thing is, the uh, the first Amnesia game was pretty. Frictional Games has a good has a good record when it come when it comes to doing decent horror games. Um, the second game was done by the Chinese Room, i.e. the the people behind um, the vastly vastly overrated Dear Esther. Okay. Frick, I'm not saying I'm not saying that this is going to be a banger, and it's come it's coming out on October twentieth. What I am saying is that I have more faith that they'll be able to get they'll be able to get this right. Okay. Um, especially since apparently we're going to be lost in the Algerian <laughs> desert, which Ew. that's a um, that's a setting that's a setting that we don't that we don't see often in in horror games or even in a lot of fiction. Deserts or Algeria? Uh, a little of both. Yeah, Por no los dos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty much. I think the last time we had a big desert setting was when uh, Ubisoft did Ass Creed. Ass Creed Origins. Yeah. Because they because they were because they're so de and uh, because they're so desperate to avoid do, doing Assassin's Creed in Japan to the point where, well, Sucker Punch intervened and the rest is history. <laughs> Uh, that's just a reminder to everybody that um, Ghost of Tsushima is a better Assassin's Creed Japan than anything Ubisoft will ever make. So now, next, um, now I know some people have dismissed Rivals of Aether as just being a Smash clone, but um, that having played it myself, calling it a Smash clone doesn't quite do it justice. I mean, there's certainly some Smash elements, but it's doing its own thing, especially since it's um it's co its combo system is a little bit more in depth. I don't know, I just I already had one too many platform fighters, uh namely Smash itself that I yeah. never really got interested. But apparently, Rivals of Aether is heading to is heading to Switch as a definitive edition on the twenty fourth, and the stuff that's getting added for the definitive edition, if you already have it on Steam, like I do, that's going to be free. Nice. So the definitive edition is only going to be thirty bucks, and it's free for anybody who's already got the game on Steam. Um, presumably, they'll be upgrading to definitive as an update. As the original yep. twelve characters, along with Ori and Stein from Ori in the Blind Forest and Shovel Knight, um, hmm. along with multiplayer story and Abyss modes being in, there will also be a new mode called Tetherball. Um, they are going to improve online features with up to four player matches and online support for Abyss Versus, Abyss Endless, and Tetherball. A milestone system that allows you to unlock cosmetics with progress. And those who had purchased a DLC character on Steam prior to the Fan of Edition's launch will unlock the infamous skin for that character. And the other and of and also the fact that the Steam Works the this game is still connected to Steam Workshop. Nice. 
So that means all the little customizations people have made in the workshop are still going to be usable. Yep. Well, at least, you know, I forget who which indie group it is that made Rivals of Ether, but uh, they, they've always been pretty good about being good to the, the fan base, so... Mm -hmm. This is this is pretty par for the course for them, and I'm glad that they keep st they keep to their guns. Sticking to your guns is important in this day and age. What I'm seeing a lot with with indies is since they know that they can't compete with the big with the bigger entries, it's more about giving the best experience for the people who are coming to them. And that's a better model of business. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what this tetherball mode is going to be. That one I could see being. Plenty of um, bat shit. Um, maybe it's two teams of two and each is tethered to each other. I'm, so gu I'm, guess off, I'm guessing it's more. I'm guessing it's more. I'm guessing it's more like the death ball in um, Anarchy Reigns. Oh, or okay. Instead, yeah. instead of about kicking each other's ass, it's about trying to get a. It's about trying to get a ball into into one side of the stage. Yeah. Whereas this one's probably tethered to the center of the stage and you're supposed to use it to knock each other off, maybe? Yeah, maybe. So next, Doom 64, the ver the um, po the port that Night Dive handled, uh -huh. is getting a port to PS4 and Switch um, that's <laughs> in a physical form from Limited Run Games. Nice. And I have to say that the, the um, port... Now I ended up getting the this particular port from um, from pre-ordering Doom Eternal, and I have to say, for, for up until this point, the best way to play Doom sixty four was um, sixty four EX. Yeah, that's not the case anymore. The Night Dive version is superior, especially since they added a whole new batch of batch of um, batch of maps for the, for it. Basic, basically, t basically, an attempt to tie in Doom sixty four to to the uh, to the remaining games, which makes sense because they've just you know the game the, the games are already batshit to begin with. So tying in one two sixty four, twenty sixteen and Eternal is makes sense. Although, it's one of those Doom Doom sixty four when it comes to the old school Dooms, um, sixty four is it's better than the original. It's not quite as good as Doom 2. And but I do think it's impressive what they were able to what they were able to get out of the N64's hardware because there were a, there were a handful of mon there were plenty of monsters that they had to cut out. Yeah. Although some of the ones that they left in um made me raise an eyebrow. The main one being why the hell did you keep the pain elemental? Because it's iconic. <laughs> Cacos are more iconic than the than the fucking pain elemental. Nobody like <laughs> nobody likes the pain elemental because all it does is spawn the enemy that everybody despised in the original Doom. Uh, yeah, the tortured souls. Yeah, or blazing souls, I should call them. Um. The actual term is lost souls, but um, now yeah, at the but very they least catch with fire Doom and explode. Yeah, at the very least with Doom Two, they were, le they were um less they were less annoying because you could just you could just use the super shotgun and you'd be fine. As opposed then to in, as opposed to having to use so much goddamn plasma ammo. And then in and then in Eternal, it's best to return the uh, lost souls to the pain elementals to kill them. Oh, there's, well, in both in both um in both in both Doom Four and uh, Doom Eternal, um, Lost Souls aren't nearly as much of a nuisance as they've been in the past. They're still a bloody nuisance. Not as much of one doesn't mean they stop being a nuisance. There was a reason the phrase "less lethal" is a thing. But. With all that said, that's going to that's gonna do it for this particular run of, of the Gazette. Ended up being a bit late, but better late than never. And we'll be we'll be back we'll be back soon with the with the Geek Watch we had planned on doing last week, but things happened. Yeah. So stay tuned tomorrow for Super Sentai: The Drunken Sailor. 
and of course, and of course, thank thanks for everybody for t for tuning in. And until next time, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>